another area in which the aura is very essential is the area of relationships. So relationships can be viewed from an aura level or from a chakra level. So from a chakra level the most essential thing is to see if those chakras can in a way uh, be in harmony with each other, if especially the heart chakra is willing to in a way, incorporate the energy of the other um, so that the other becomes a part of your personality structure, you are allowing yourself to adapt to being together with the other person. So if you can in a way say that the other person is existing in your heart, that is usually a very good sign that there is a willingness to, to, uh, to adapt and to build up a relationship and to grow towards each other. But unfortunately it is not always enough. Because what is often a make or break for relationships is the quality of communication. This is where the aura comes in. So even if two people may be very similar, very alike, if their auras are blocking each other, then they won't even know that they are alike or similar or uh, would have a lot to share or are unable to share. If we look at like the, the perfect case, you could say, then you will see that um, when two people's auras meet, that the filters disappear between them so that people feel no need to block out certain elements either of themselves or of the other person in their togetherness so that there's complete openness and honesty uh, about everything and that this should exist on all levels so on a spiritual level, mental level, emotional level and the physical level as well and possibly even also on the level of life forms. In general, we find that people don't do this. Even though they may have been married for 20 years, they still don't do this. We often have um, defensive mechanisms and we learn that yeah, being sharing with everybody, being open to everybody, will usually yeah, get us hurt or betrayed or disappointed uh, is it, if it is not reciprocal. So we tend to be cautious, we tend to shield ourselves and only sparingly open up. And then of course you have the negative reinforcement. Like if you've been hurt by a person you're less likely to open up to them again. And you can in a way generalize that. If I've been hurt by women I want to open up to women. If I'm hurt by men I want to open up to men. And hopefully you can narrow it down, like, okay, I'm not going to be open to macho men or um, manipulative women. And then you're no longer generalizing it into a fear of the opposite sex, but already narrowing it down to the very trait of that particular member of the opposite sex, which was causing you problems. Um, that is okay, because we need to survive, we need to take care of ourselves. But if you are applying these yeah, defenses and are in a way constantly wary of your partner, uh, it's not going to help with a very quick, open, flowing communication very easily. So we're all victims of our past. And in the aura, the past is usually comes this either emotional trauma or um, you could say a, a belief system which is on the mental level. So this is usually where most of the blockages happen in regard to uh, problems within relationships and or. So these belief systems they're in a way con continuously creating a certain type of behavior. It is a program and it is spawning a similar type of thought, a similar way of interaction con continuously. So it prevents us from adapting to the situation. We've been in a way traumatized and this trauma has left a stigma in our aura and this stigma
stigma will, in a way, prevent further damage by activating yeah, a defense mechanism which is continuously like blocking things which are considered to be dangerous. You can compare it a little bit to uh, a computer's firewall. So, to work with it, we need to be able to identify where these, yeah, you could say, stones are in the river of communication, which are yeah, impenetrable, even though people might love each other. And sometimes, also these stones can indicate that a relationship will be unsuccessful, or at least very difficult, because there can be very fundamental differences between the partners. It doesn't mean that the relationship can't be a good learning relationship, but it will also mean that the typical goal of a romantic relationship to become one, to really meld into each other, uh, is not possible or not advisable, because one or the other will have to give up their path to be able to be with the other person, and usually this is not a worthwhile choice. So it is fine for one person to be dominant in a relationship, but it is not good to lose yourself. If we look at the emotional patterns, the emotional patterns are usually more things which are repeating themselves. Uh, not directly blocking, but more disturbing the contact with the partner. For instance, if I have learned that um, crying works and if I cry then my partner will do whatever I want I will have this pattern of crying a lot and this will be my tool of manipulation and it's often an unconscious choice to use this or another tool uh, but also it is again not being really in open communication it is a manipulative communication based on the success of those manipulations from the past and it also implies an inequality in the relationship that either I am the weaker one and I need to, in a way, beg or behave in a certain way to get something, or that I'm the superior one and through my art of manipulation I can get whatever I want from my partner. So also these emotional patterns can be very disturbing for the quality of the relationship physical level is, oddly enough, often the easiest level. And often, this was also felt by, by a couple, that, gosh, we are having a lot of problems, we don't agree with each other, we fight a lot, I don't feel comfortable around him, but the sex is good. And often the quality of the, the physical union um, is seen as kind of like a compensation for the problems on other levels. Uh, ultimately, yeah, it is no compensation because you want to be one on all levels, not just on the physical level, but the physical level is generally the easiest one, um, unless the, the person have had some problems uh, with that. So for women it is often that they have been uh, subjected to undesired sexual intimacy, uh, as happens yeah, to, unfortunately, a quite large percentage of women. Um, when this has happened, then they often start feeling uncomfortable with intimacy, with their own bodies, with um, surrendering to uh, uh, their partners. Um, for men it is often also more to do with uh, stress, uh, fear, uncertainty, um, low self-esteem, um, which causes them to prefer in a way to hide or to in a way, judge themselves instinctively unworthy of procreation. So it's important to note that these things are not unhealthy. If, for instance, a male is experiencing a lot of stress, he's not an alpha male, but he's an omega male, then basically uh, it's not good for the species if such a man would yeah, procreate, would pass on their unfitness to the next generation, which will ultimately weaken uh, the group by taking resources from the group. 
So it is a perfectly natural instinct, but as experienced by the individual, it is rather unpleasant. In a similar way, for the female, if they feel that yeah, the, the males in that society are, in a way, uh, misbehaving, are unfriendly, are unsupportive, they make her feel insecure, uh, it would be good for that specific little tribe uh, to die out if they are not taking good care of the, of the females. So again, instinctively it is a very good thing, it's good for the health of the species if the unfit males cannot procreate. Problem is, we are not living in closed groups of maybe two, three hundred humans anymore. We live in a very big society. So these generalizations of like, I'm unfit, um, doesn't really apply because if you feel unfit as a male, who are you going to compare yourself to? It's not a group of like maybe a hundred other males, it is now a comparison with millions of other males which you're excluding yourself from and you might not be as unfit as you think you are. Same way for a woman who may think that the males in her group or in her society are not good breeding material. But who is your society? There's no longer that group of a hundred males from your little village, but it's now something applied to billions of men. So our instincts have not adapted to the change of scale in human society. And this is why often they're, you could say, while instinctively correct, um, they're overgeneralizing and being applied in cases where they should not be applied. To fix all these things, we need actually several things. Um, we need to let go of the yeah, incorrect programmings which have resulted from our past and we need to create correct programmings. We need to build on trust, we need to improve um, the ability to surrender, to open up to each other. And there are many ways to do this, um, but often it requires um, the willingness to, to surrender, to be humble, to be in a way also dominated even. Um, and often we find that couples who are struggling in their relationship will unconsciously start playing dominance games. Uh, to find out what will happen if they will really surrender or really leave things to the other, if this will be good or not, and then they have to overcome their own fears um, of um, yeah, opening up and surrendering to the other. So this is, although it is often experienced as problematic to have dominant struggles and dominance issues in a relationship, it's actually a way to heal the relationship and to reset things and to focus on the now rather than on the past. So if dominance games happen, it is usually a good sign that the relationship is going in a rather deep level. That doesn't include of course um, dominance games which are created by, uh, by fear. A good dominance game allows the will of one person to be expressed by the dominator and to be accepted by the uh, submissive. And by interchanging this, you can really learn a lot about each other. Um, what is seemingly a dominance game but isn't is if one person is full of fear and because of the fear wants to control the situation or to manipulate the partner because then the dominator is not really relaxed in their position they're not feeling safe or accepted by the submissive nor is the submissive accepting the role as submissive they are being yeah manipulated or dominated but they're not free of resistance 
to this process. So this process of surrendering to each other is very important to resolve these issues if they're occurring in the aura. What we generally find if you look at a relationship is that relationships don't happen unless at least on one of these yeah, uh, three often experienced levels like mental, emotional and physical there is really a kind of an openness and surrender to each other so some relationships are just based on physicality, emotionality or on yeah, uh, a meeting of minds it can happen that people are also attract us merely because of the, uh, the spiritual energies that they feel a karmatic connection or um, an attraction because the person has an energy which they crave or find interesting. So you need at least one of these levels to be open for any good bonding to occur. And if the bonding doesn't progress beyond the other levels, in general the relationship will collapse again. Because ultimately one level tends not to be satisfactory. Often as soon as you have two levels then the relationship will already become stable. The people will feel enough support, enough stimulation from the relationship, but may still feel other things are missing, but oh well, situations are simply imperfect. It's also a lot easier in a way to have a relationship if the person either has very little experience to, yeah, block them, indoctrinate them, or when the person has been able to deal with their experience. If the person is in a way jumping from one relationship into the next without really processing the traumas of a separation, uh, going through a period of mourning, of loss uh, after the separation, then this person will often carry with them into the next relationship still a lot of patterns from the previous relationship. So it is good for the person to take a few months to yeah, say, reset themselves to get out of the previous relationship before going into the new one. Uh, unfortunately the opposite is true of the ego. Uh, because the ego wants to exist in a state of happiness, in a state of joy, in a state of bliss, in a state of security. And often the partner is creating that security. And if the ego is quite strong, then often the person will also move very quickly from relationship into relationship. And people compare it to a monkey swinging through the trees, like they let go of one branch, but they're immediately grabbing the other. And this way they go from partner to partner, without really taking a break in between. And often this is motivated by the ego and by survival fears of the ego. Usually if the person is a stronger person, is more uh, at peace with themselves, is more sure of themselves, they can stand to be alone for a longer period and they can be comfortable with taking the time to mourn uh, the previous relationship and uh, they don't feel they need to jump into the very next opportunity to feel supported or not alone. So it's often a healthy pattern if a person can take between six months and one or two years between relationships to really purge their auras from the unhealthy patterns which they may have uh, uh, incurred. When we, uh, as a partner, find that our uh, partner is blocking us, it is rather difficult to address the issue because we are seen as being intrusive or overwhelming somehow, which is why such a blockage is put up. And if we try to remove the blockage, we hit even more resistance because the person feels even more invaded or overwhelmed or insecure by your trying to remove their security. Um, so often a person trying to build a really open uh, and honest relationship will inspire a lot of fear in their partner because an open and honest relationship would imply that the other person has to give up their security system. Um, so unwillingly the open and honest
close partner will become a rather threatening presence. To work on it, it is important in a way for the partner not to try to push um, their partner to yeah, let go of their security or to be open and honest as well. Um, because it's not about the quality of the relationship, it's about how the person can deal with themselves, with their past. So it is much more the responsibility of, the, of each partner to deal with their own blockages rather than have their partner help them with those blockages. But of course you can ask support from your partner if you feel you want to build up a new pattern or you want to talk about things which happened in the past so you can transform them or let go of them. But we should resist the desire to work upon each other, to uh, focus upon the problems and to see the other person as a problem which needs to be solved. Because ultimately this will also destroy the relationship. You're no longer working on the basis of freedom, uh, equality, but you're starting to go into yeah, uh, a client-therapist relationship or an actor and subject relationship. And this is not what a relationship should be about. It can be about that. You can have a healing relationship. And this can be the goal of your, of your joining. But if you're looking for a long time romantic commitment, uh, it's not the proper way to go about it. So you should leave um, yeah, working on each other to relationship therapists or psychologists or um, healers who can help the person to deal with their issues so they can be in the relationship in a better manner. So relationship therapy is not only about yeah, working on your communication and understanding each other, but it is also an understanding your own past and dealing with your own past and maybe reshaping yourself or also accepting that you are the way you are and it might not completely fit with your partner. And as long as there is acceptance and there is enough basis for a healthy and nourishing relationship, that is fine. Another thing which is also often an issue is exclusivity. Um, many men and women are insecure. And often this insecurity leads also to a kind of a desire to control their partner, to possess their partner, to be... Um, jealous or envious and um, you could say that the, the, the envy is uh, kind of, you could say the ambitious side you want to have the other person's wife or the same type of relationship uh, the other person has um, or the, the, the love or support that partner is giving to their partner um, so it's often a, a sense that your own situation is not sufficient, is not enough. But often this sense is again coming from a feeling of unsafety, insecurity, uh, which is often the driving force behind any ambition, that you in a way sense a lack. And often this lack is more of a, a part of your personality and it will always exist no matter what you get. So it's good if you can realize that, wow, I have all this ambition, but also it is an itch which I can't scratch, it will always exist. Um, I will never be satisfied. And that's also fine, because you can use this energy, use this focus, to achieve goals which you want to achieve, but rather than being guided by these envious thoughts. Uh, jealousy is more about uh, property about seeing um, the other person or the other objects, the little toy you have, as yours and yours alone. Um, often this comes from a fear of losing it, of not having enough. And therefore you want to control something and even to the limit of preferring to destroy it, to kill your partner, rather than share your partner or lose your partner. 
Ultimately, this is a very fear-based reaction. You think that without your partner, you cannot survive, or without your partner, you are less or insufficient. And therefore, you become exceedingly possessive and mistrustful. Alas, often this works in a very opposite fashion. If you are very controlling, very possessive, the other person is going to feel restricted and are going to seek freedom, seek release from the cage or in a way energetically uh, putting them in. So often you get a negative spiral that the person is afraid that they will be betrayed so they react by being very jealous and by the very act of being jealous they drive away their partners into somebody else's arms as a result of which they will even be more jealous with the next partner. It is important to, uh, to break these cycles. These behaviors of envy and jealousy, they exist both in the personality level, so they are part of the aura, uh, the chakra structure, but also in the communication level. And what happens is that if we are envious, we are allowing the impulses which we desire to come straight to our core. We are in a way uh, not judging uh, the things we are envious of. When I want to have, for instance, a beautiful sports car which somebody else has, I'm not judging it, I'm not thinking like, oh, but it's, it's really expensive to maintain, and what will the insurance cost because it might be stolen, and my god, it has a terrible gas mileage. <laughs> How can I afford to drive anywhere? Those thoughts tend not to occur to a person who is envious. And this is in a way a deformation of the aura, because normally the aura is able to assess everything as it is going in. But not if we are envious, become very yeah, obsessed with what we want. And then usually once we have it, we become shocked by the reality of what it is like to have it, which can be very disturbing to us to possess it. Um, so we tend to, um, yeah, to crave things which are not good for us if we are behaving in such a way. It is very similar in a way to the way an addict behaves, who is in a way constantly craving uh, drugs. And an envious way is also constantly in a process of craving things which are generally not meant for them or not good for them. And in both sides you have a deformation of the aura where either the energy of the drug or of the other thing is not processed on all levels. So there is, you could say, a hole in the normal filter systems which is allowing these impulses to go through, but the essence of the hole is usually coming from the aura structure which is defective and thereby also creates a defective filtering mechanism. With regards to jealousy, um, with regards to jealousy, we tend to, in a way, um, try to absorb energy of the other and not let it go. And it's, in a way it works and in another way it doesn't work. So we want the partner, we are open to the partner, we are often showing our, in a way, mm -hmm. behaving in a submissive way because we are putting the partner on a pedestal so their energy will flow to us. And for uh, a, a jealous person, they are continually wanting to be reaffirmed, to feel the energy flowing into them. So they are often putting themselves into a weaker position, or they create fear or uncertainty or panic or um, other things which lower their vibration, so that the energy of their partner will flow to them. Um, it's not very pleasant for the partner, of course, to be continually confronted with the partner which has a lower energy and is leeching energy of them, so because this is yeah, basically a parasitical relationship which then exists. Also, the energy which has flown into the jealous person is then, in a way, not allowed to flow back. And this is creating a bond. So the uh, similar energies attract similar energies, so the jealous person is in a way attracting their mate again by captivating the energy. The mate will 
unconsciously try to recapture their energy from uh, the jealous partner and will therefore always be thinking about them or also be drawn to them. So jealousy is also attractive but it is also very unhealthy because the vibration of both the jealous person and of the part of the jealous person will be drawn down into a state of fear, a state of anger, um, sometimes even bordering insanity. So a relationship where there is a lot of jealousy is often a mutually destructive relationship where the jealousy is destroying you and also your partner rather than building things up as is the purpose of a relationship also there cannot be a complete sharing, a complete unity in a relationship where there is jealousy because always the jealous partner will feel uh, the need to gain control, to manipulate the partner and by being completely open and honest there is no more opportunity to in a way play games with their partner so as you've heard the aura is very very important for a good quality of relationship to go a little bit more into the jealousy part what often happens is that energy is sucked in through a part of the aura which is in a way made low and then usually it is blocked from going out again by putting up a high wall of usually morality. So often the jealous partner will claim weakness, will claim like I cannot be without you, I get so sad if you leave me, uh, please call me, I'm always thinking about you things like this, they will feign weakness to pull in the energy and then they will block the energy from moving back by going to a much higher state. My gosh, I'm so enthusiastic, I'm so happy and uh, I'm the better one in this relationship. The jealous partner will often also claim superiority or try to attain superiority because I'm the one who's always calling you, I'm the one who's always caring for you, I'm the one who's always listening to you so you dare not abandon me uh, which in a way becomes uh, yeah, bribing behavior or blackmailing behavior which is ultimately not trust, not love, not equality and not freedom therefore making the so much desired union uh, in the romantic relationship impossible. I hope this has been instructive and will help you uh, help others who are suffering from these afflictions.